um, welcome back everybody. So let's continue with the second talk of today's program. Luke Stackhauer will tell us about invertible topological field theory with fermionic symmetries. Please. All right. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for the opportunity to speak here and thanks to the organizers for this uh, for organizing this interesting topic. Um, so I'm not sure. I hope that the blackboard is sort of readable. I try and write very large and if the general opinion is that it's totally unreadable. Let me know, then I'll switch to my iPad uh, instead. All right. So my talk is going to be about uh, mainly about uh, work in progress of um, my advisor and collaborators, so Craig Schultz Teicher, um, and their work is uh, very is inspired very strongly by the. Uh, famous work, I would say, by now, of Frieden Hopkins. Um, and I'll tie it a little bit together um, in my own formulation, and I'll combine it um, with some work that's uh, joined with Lucas Miller. Um, okay, so the, the plan for the talk is uh, the first half will be a Blackboard talk, and the second half will be slides on my iPad. Um, and in the first half, I'll most, mostly explain one point of view on uh, how to include uh, fermionic symmetries, how to describe symmetries of fermionic systems in, um, in topological, mainly topological quantum field theories. And um, I will also go into uh, very, I mean, it's in a similar spirit to the last talk. I'll go into like these topological actions. I will call them topological partition functions. It's uh, very similar to the last talk. Um, and then in the second part, I'll focus more on topological field theories themselves. And I'll also discuss unitarity. And if there's time, I'll discuss spin statistics as well. So, but for now, um, my goal is going to be um, describing one mathematical framework for uh, symmetries, um, of systems with fermions. And um, there was already a very nice motivation in the last talk for invertible uh, topological field theories coming from um, anomalies. We're mostly discussing anomalies. And one other big application of invertible field theories uh, is symmetry protected topological phases. So I'll start with a, a Nobel Prize, which should be well known. The, Nobel Prize from 2016 on uh, topological insulators. And I'll not really discuss what a topological insulator is at all. The only thing I want to do, oh, I have to write large, 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 large. Um, I want to extract the information of uh, what kind of symmetry the system has. So if I ask a physicist, they will tell me there's a, a time reversal symmetry. So um, this is a symmetry protecting the topological order. And then there's the uh, electro electromagnetic U1 charge symmetry. Uh, and they satisfy a couple of commutation relations. Like we have been told that um, time reversing symmetries should be anti-unitary. So you should have a relation that looks something uh, like this. And um, in particular, there should be also a relation that looks something like this, e to the i a q. So that's my u1 element corresponding to charge. So a is some real parameter here. Um, it doesn't quite commute with t because t is anti-unitary, but there's a little sign change in the exponent. And then there's another thing that's important in fermionic systems, and that, that's that t squared is not equal to one, but it's equal to minus one to the f. And what do I write down now as a mathematician? I want to know what the symmetry group is. 
my conclusion from this is that G is U1, that's the charge part. And I have a Z mod four coming from the time reversal part. Um, but they are not quite a direct product, but it's a semi-direct product. And the action of um, Z mod four on U1 is given by the surjection to Z mod two and Z mod two acts by inverse like that. And then there's one additional thing that you could demand in this situation, if you like, which is called the spin charge relation, which says that there's a relation between spin and charge. And one way to formulate it is minus one to the Q is minus one to the F. So physically just says that a particle has odd charge if and only if it is a fermion. And this leads me to, if I assume this, then I have to require that this minus one to the Q, which is in here, is identified with the minus one to the F, which is an element in here. And I have to quotient by a diagonal Z mod two group here. And this allows me to identify the symmetry group in this specific example. So what are some particular properties of this, um, of this symmetry group? I want to formalize it in a definition. And the definition is the following. I define a fermionic symmetry group, a fermionic group, to be a collection of a couple of things. So I have my compact V group, which is like the symmetry itself. Then I have a continuous homomorphism. Which measures for me which symmetries are time reversing and which are time preserving. Uh, and I think I'll try to write Z mod two additively in this presentation. And please excuse me I, if I make mistakes with that. So for me, Z mod two is going to be zero and one, I think. And then there's a final piece of data, which is a choice of a central element, which I call minus one to the F. So that's fermion parity. The, that's some element in the group. And it satisfies, well, clearly I want to have that squares to one if the notation makes any sense. And I also want to demand that it's time preserving. So that's my definition of what the symmetry of a fermionic system should be. We've seen already a very physical example. Here's a very mathematical example. Um, if I start with a finite dimensional um, super algebra, so a Z2 graded algebra respecting the multiplication, the grading is respecting the multiplication. And I wanna think of this as the on part being time reversing and the even part being time preserving. So it's not really super in a sense of fermions versus bosons. Then I define the following uh, group. It's the collection of homogeneous and invertible elements inside A. And this comes with an obvious map to Z mod two given by uh, theta of A is just the degree of A. And this is not compact because it contains all these scalars, scalar multiple of the identity. So I'll just take a quotient by only positive scalars, just to get rid of those scalars, to make it into a complex V group. And now I define my minus one to the F to be the class of minus one in here. And this gives me an example of a um, fermionic group. Luke? Yes. If you, um, so you allow the central elements to be the identity or do you want it to have exact order too? 
Oh, I really was afraid that I would get this question. <laughs> like, maybe at some point in my life, I will be able to make this decision. But at the moment, it's very hard. But I think for this presentation, I allow it to be one. Um, but I mean, I agree that then it's not really very fermionic. But, um, it's, it's a very good question. Um, so related to the example I just gave, you have this relevant theorem, I think, by Wall, which says that there are only, or there are exactly 10 uh, so-called super division algebras. So those are super algebras uh, over the real numbers for which all homogeneous elements are already invertible. Um, and in particular, using the last construction, this gives us a condition, uh, sorry, this gives us a list of 10 very special fermionic groups. And this is related to the so-called tenfold way in condensed matter physics. So this gives um, a collection of 10 internal symmetry groups um, that one could describe as internal symmetry groups of so-called uh, 10 symmetry classes that occur for symmetry protected topological phases. So one example, which goes back to the example that I just erased, is if I take the super algebra to be the Clifford algebra with two negative squares, then G of A is going to be uh, thing to minus. And in fact, you can show that it's isomorphic to the, to the class A2 topological insulator um, example that I just started the lecture with. So, okay. So these are fermionic groups. Now I wanna go on to describing um, quantum field theories well, I don't know what a quantum field theory is, but at least starting with describing what fermionic symmetries should be of uh, topological field theories, at least. And for that, I need first some notation. So I will denote group will be the grading involution of a fermionic group, which is the map that it's a uh, automorphism of a fermionic group that maps um, a group element to minus one to the f is, if the element is odd, or sorry, if the element is time reversing. Sometimes I'll say off since it's a Z2 group. I should say time reversing. So if it's time reversing, it's mapped to minus one to the f times itself, and otherwise it's just sent to itself. So that's some automorphism of the group of order two. And now um, this will be the main construction uh, that I will use to describe um, uh, quantum symmetries on space time. Um, so if I have two fermionic groups, then their fermionic tensor product is defined as the following semi-direct product. G semi-direct H mod common Z2, Z2 F. So every time I write Z2 F, it means one minus one to the F, the group Z mod two, in which one of the two is permanent parity, uh, in which H acts on G by uh, first its grading, and then the Z2 acts by the grading homomorphism on uh, G. And um, this looks very abstract, um, but you can make it super concrete by just writing out the formula, what this means. So very concretely, if I write two elements of, of this group, then the multiplication is just sort of, um, it's sort of tensor products over the Z mod 2F with the coastal sign. So it is, 
uh, well, there's a sine, a causal sine, but it will just be G1, G2, these are H1, H2. But then there is a sign which depends on how much elements you, all the elements you switch with each other. Is there a good chunk? <laughs> Um, okay, so this is like similar to what the tensor product would be of super algebras. That's the idea. And the resulting thing here, just like if you take the tensor product of two super algebras, is Z2 cross Z2 graded. Like there are now sort of two gradings. And I want to use them both. It decomposes into four parts now, even times odd, and odd times even, and even times even, and odd times odd. And in particular, you have the sort of diagonal grading, and I want to take the even part with respect to that. So very concretely, I could take H G tensor H, and what's the even part? So zero for the kernel of sort of the, the math to C2. Well, it's G naught tensor, so very schematically, it's this. And I just throw away all the parts that contain something in the form G naught times H1 or the other way around. Um, Okay, so now I get to what uh, this is also related to the last talk, I guess. If you are given an internal symmetry group, how do you make the fermionic group that, of course, that you should put on space time? So, given an internal fermionic group, uh, I will define the, the space time structure group. So this is where the Lorentz symmetry comes in as well. And let's fix some space time dimension. And what is it? It is the fermionic tensor product of the internal symmetry group with sort of the the Euclidean plus fermionic version plus allowing reversing uh, orientations of the of the Lorentz group, and then I take the the even part of that. So I only allow symmetries that combine, for example, a time reversing symmetry with a, a symmetry that a Lorentz symmetry that reverses the orientation of space time. Um, okay, so let's do. Maybe some examples. So a simple case is, well, maybe a very general case. It's the case in which there are no time reversing symmetries. And then what you recover is um, you take the internal symmetry group and you just take the product with spin. And the only thing you have to do is you have to mod out about a common Z mod two uh, right here. So in particular, we can get back to the situation. And this is the reason that I answered Theo Johnson Fried's uh, question um, as I did. So in particular, if I require, if I take minus one to the F to be one, which is a little bit weird, but I would, I'm allowing it now in the presentation. So this is, I take it to be one inside G. Then the thing that I recover is going to be uh, G mod, uh, sorry, G cross SOD. So that's going to be the structure group of a bosonic theory without time reversing symmetry. And maybe one uh, case with time reversing symmetries. So let's take G to be um, in minus one, which is an extremely complicated way to say Z mod four. Um, but I write the C mod 4 as 1 minus 1 to the F T 
minus one to the f t. So t squares to uh, minus one to the f. Um, and then you can check that h d is going to be confusingly, it's going to be in plus d actually, even though you might have expected it to be minus. But that's the thing that should agree with the physics, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. And what's now the point of this whole part? The point is that I claim that what we should do is we should endow, if we have an internal symmetry, we should, I guess, uh, I should say, I wanna couple the, the symmetry to a background gauge field. So endow the space time with an HD structure. I don't really have time to explain exactly what an H structure is on a manifold, which I apologize. Um, but at least if H is spin, then it's like a spin structure. If it's SO, it's something like an orientation. Um, and I'm very topological field theory focused here, I should say. So if you're not doing topological field theory, you should probably endow it with a differential HD structure. So you also include the gauge connections and stuff like that. Um, but I will discuss how much the field can use for now. So. And in fact, I will start with not even doing topological field theories, but just, just homomorphisms, sort of out of boredism groups. So just partition functions for simplicity. Um, and those will be related to invertible topological field theories. With fermionic symmetries. Um, and for that, uh, since I want to also consider non unitary invertible field theories, uh, I will need a little bit more complicated version of a Bordism group. If you know any type of Bordism groups, this, is my, this might be uh, one that you're not very used to. And if you're from uh, the Max Planck Institute in Bonn, then you know this as the SKK group. If you grew up somewhere else, you might know it as Reinhard Bordism, I think, or vector field Bordism, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but what is it? I take closed H manifolds, and I, so those form a monoid on their disjunct union. Then I take the Grodin group associated to that. And then I quotient out by the SKK relations. Um, and uh, I decided to risk my career and make a picture of the SKK relations on the blackboard. Uh, so there we go. Um, so the relations go as follow. Um, it's a four term relation. So I take uh, two manifolds like this and I can take two sort of hypersurfaces that are diffeomorphic here. And then I'm allowed to, to switch them. So this is equivalent to, and now I just flip the two pictures around and now it should look slightly similar if my drawing skills are reasonable. Um, uh, let's see, I flip the upper parts. So it looks something like this, I guess. this, this is the SKK relation. And this will give me uh, some of the union group under disjoint union. And then um, what is going to be a sort of invertible field theory? Well, I don't wanna do topological field theories just yet, but a um, invertible uh, topological partition function, maybe I should have called it 
a topological action because it's closely related to that notion uh, that we had in the last talk. Um, and what is it? The partition function is a homomorphism from the SKK group. There you go, to C cross. So this can represent some possibly non unitary invertible topological field theory. Can we get the partition function of that? And maybe this is the right time to remark in comparison to the last presentation that I'm considering discrete invertible field theories here. So, you, so I'm not doing the physically correct thing of considering this Anderson dual and doing all the nice things that we've seen in the last presentation. So in particular, things like term Simon's terms and stuff like that will not be contained in here. So, um, so that's unfortunate. Um, but let's do an example at least, an example that uh, is different from examples that we've seen in the last presentation. So what I could do is, I mean, this is, I'm gonna fix a complex number. This is sort of my, my theta angle, if you will, even though it's not quite that. And my partition function, um, my manifold, is just going to be, pull up that to the Euler characteristic. So these are these Euler theories that were also sort of briefly mentioned in the last talk. Um, so this is one example. And in fact, in general, this is not unitary uh, invertible uh, partition function. Um, okay, so I'm going to tell you a couple of facts. So you might know another Borders group. Uh, and in fact, this SKK group, there is a map from the SKK group to that Borders group. So that borders group is usually written like this. So that's the monoid of HD manifolds of the bordism. Um, and this is not always an isomorphism, um, but it's always subjective. So here's one interesting example, which is the case that I mentioned two and the structure group is uh, O. In that case, the exact, I'm making a mistake. So sequence is like this. And it turns out that the degree two or the dimension two bordism group is isomorphic to Zeno two. And this extension is actually not split. So this is a non-split extension. But this is sort of the, the most general null splitness that can happen in these kind of uh, invertible theories. So you can prove the following, which classifies um, basically invertible theories if you know the um, if you know the uh, unitary ones. But we'll discuss that later. So in the, the even case. You can show that the SKK group is isomorphic to a pullback of the ordinary Mordism group. It's a little diagram like this. It's this pullback. I can map the Mordism group always to Z mod two by taking the Euler characteristic modulo. Uh, modulo two, that's always a Bordism invariant because it's an integral over the top Stiefel Whitney class. And here it's just the, the Z mod two map. So this is in D even. Uh, what happens for D odd? Well, I don't quite know. It doesn't seem to be well known. Um, but, uh, but Something has been proven by Matthias Kreck and others. So this is again a theorem of Kreck-Schultz-Teichner. Uh, 
for d odd, there is a exact sequence. It's always surjective on the right, as I just told you, but it's not always surjective in the beginning. And in fact, uh, this map is exactly injective if uh, every HD plus one manifold, so in one dimension higher, has even Euler characteristic. Sounds like a great condition, but in practice, uh, it's actually really hard to determine whether every every manifold has even Euler characteristic. That's a super hard question. So, um, yeah, and I'm also not aware of any non-split uh, examples. So that would be interesting to know. Incredible! This was exactly half an hour. So I now. Uh, wanted to switch to the second part of my presentation. So I'll now go to uh, share my screen. Let's try and get the shot dust off my iPad. Okay, all right. So the next part is going to be more about, uh, yeah, actually topological field theories. Uh, I will not just consider the invertible case, but also some non-invertible things. Uh, I hope that's not too confusing, um, right? So let's get to it. So I will discuss like the, the main two things I want to discuss about topological field theories are reflection positivity and the spin statistics theory. So for that, I will start with uh, first explaining what reflection structures are on manifolds a little bit, reflection structures on topological field theories. And uh, next I will get to reflection positive topological field theories and touch upon the relation with uh, dagger functors. Uh, and if there's time, I hope there will be time, um, I will also discuss the spin statistics theorem for topological field theories, in particular for invertible topological field theories. Um, oh, and I should say that um, when I say topological field theory here, I always mean the Atiyah Siegel style uh, functorial definition of a topological field theory, mostly just the non extended version. Um, and if you're fancy, I will sometimes do once extended, um, but mostly just the classical definition of topological field theory. Okay, so first, what are invertible topological field theories? I already mentioned that word a lot of times. Um, so basically, invertible topological field theories are in one to one correspondence with these invertible topological partition functions that I wrote down. Uh, one very mathematical way to say that is that um, if you have uh, an invertible partition function like I just like I wrote on the board, then you can with the appropriate target category, you can extend it further and further downwards to make a uh, extended topological field theory out of it. Um, so what does that mean in practice? So for example, just the ordinary TS um, definition, um, you can just consider topological field theories with as a target the groupoid of superlines. So you just consider one dimensional uh, Z2 graded vector spaces. Um, and so, in other words, it's just a normal topological field theory, but the super vector space is very important. We need those, we need those fermionic uh, state spaces as well um, to make this a one to one correspondence. 
Um, and yeah, so it's the usual thing that you demand for invertible theories. You need all state spaces are one dimensional, um, all partition functions are non zero, things like that. Um, and you can also do something like that once extended. And one example of such an appropriate target um, would be the bicategory of super algebras, in which objects are super algebras, one morphisms are bimodules, and uh, two morphisms are intertwiners. Um, but for most of the talk, I will just focus on this, on the second point, just normal topological field theories in a TSC sense. Um, okay, so to motivate reflection structures and reflection positivity a little bit, uh, I wanted to mention this uh, little proposition about uh, what do topological field theories with fermionic symmetry uh, in dimension one look like. Um, and this proposition here is pretty, uh, is not very hard to prove. It takes a bit of work, but it's not very hard to prove once you have the cobordism hypothesis, if you know that. Um, but the main point of this that I want to show this proposition is um, to, to show you the general structure of such a, such a one dimensional topological field theory. So um, as you might have expected, you get some kind of representation and it's a representation of the only of the time preserving symmetries. But what do the time reversing symmetries do? Well, you get all these weird bilinear forms somehow. So you get a whole collection of non-degenerate bilinear forms. Um, oh, I forgot to include here. It's very important that it should be discrete symmetry, otherwise it won't make sense. So let's assume that it's finite symmetry here. Um, so you get all these non-degenerate bilinear forms, and they satisfy this uh, this. Yeah, a bunch of relations that relate different bilinear forms to each other together with uh, these representations. So that tells us somehow how the representations are adjoint to each other or something like that in this uh, unreduced bilinear forms. And then you have an even worse equation with this expression. And it's just both mathematically bad and it's physically not really clear what this means. But once you uh, assume reflection positivity, and I don't think I already mentioned that, but reflection positivity is just the, um, the Euclidean version of unitarity. So it's just if you have a Lorentzian theory, which is unitary and weak rotated, then people usually call the Euclidean version reflection positive. Um, so what do those look like? Well, it's much easier and it's much, it's much closer to what you expect from the physics. <coughs> so a one dimensional reflection positive topological they're all isomorphic to basically a representation on a complex Hilbert space. And it's a topological field theory, so it's finite dimensional. Um, but it's not quite a complex representation. Um, so the time preserving elements act unitarily. But the time reversing elements don't even act complex linearly, but they do act anti unitarily. And that's exactly what you would expect from things like, for example, Wigner's theorem. Um, so this would make more sense to a physicist, I would guess. Um, okay, so this is a motivation to define reflection positive theories. Um, so let's get to, I will briefly go through reflection structure on manifolds. Um, so given an HD manifold, I didn't define what an HD structure is, um, but I claim you can define its reflection, which is a, so it's a kind of generalization of orientation reversal in the case that the manifold only has an orientation. Um, and uh, in particular, an HD structure does, yeah, I didn't say what it was, but it also includes an HD principle bundle. And I just wanted to highlight what the reflection does to this HD principle bundle. Um, so coming back to the part I did on the blackboard, I defined this, uh, this even part of this fermionic tensor product as the space-time structure group HD corresponding to the internal symmetry group. But uh, I mean, I defined it as the even part of this thing. So by definition of HD, there's a sure exact sequence of this form. 
Uh, and what I can do if I have a principal HD bundle, I can always enlarge it to make it twice as big um, by just taking a product like this with H hat. And then I have P sitting inside it and I sort of take the, the other part. I take not P, but I take the other sheet in this, um, in this enlarged P. And this will give me P bar, which is the HD structure uh, uh, or sorry, it's the principal HD bundle corresponding to the reflective manifold. Um, and you can continue um, playing with this and eventually um, you can show that this reflection actually extends to a whole uh, Z2 action on the, on the Borden category. I seem to have included a G here, I'm sorry. So I just mean like HD here, but by HD I, of G, I just mean that it's the HD corresponding to internal symmetry U of G. So that's a little notation issue. Um, anyhow, so it acts on, on this whole Bordism category like that. And that's a symmetric noise action. And now, uh, what is a TFT? Well, I always want to consider topological field theories with target super vector spaces because I'm also doing fermions. Um, so a topological field theory with internal fermionic symmetry G is a uh, symmetric monoidal counter like this. Um, what is a reflection structure on this? So uh, a reflection structure is a way to make this into a Z2 equivariant functor under the C2 action. And that actually turns out to be data. So it's C2 equivariance data for these two actions. Um, so extremely, I mean, this is all very abstract. So very concretely what this means is we just have a bunch of isomorphisms uh, like this. Um, so uh, get where N is like a, a spatial manifold. And they satisfy a bunch of properties, compatibility with disjoint unions and uh, braiding and things like that. Um, okay, so that's a reflection TFT. Now I want to get to reflection positivity. But first, I want to make a brief detour to the connection with that dagger categories here. So, what's a dagger category? Uh, dagger categories have been used in several reformulations of quantum mechanical uh, systems. And maybe it's not super surprising that they might also come up in this situation. So what's a dagger category? Um, it's a category which is equipped with a contravariant functor from, uh, or, yeah, from, it, from itself to itself, uh, which squares to the identity and it is also the identity on objects. Um, and you can extend this definition if you work hard enough to be compatible with symmetric monoidal structures, which we need for, uh, to make sense of topological field theories. And the main example you should keep in mind here, uh, which is also main motivation, I guess, for defining better categories, is the category of um, yeah, vector spaces with Hermitian inner products. So here I take S Herm, which is, uh, I want to take a complex super vector spaces. Um, and they're equipped with Hermitian inner products. So they're like Hilbert space inner products, but they don't have to be positive definite. That's my definition of uh, Hermitian vector space. They don't have to be positive definite. So in particular, there's the collection of uh, super Hilbert spaces is contained in that. So that's another example. Um, but now it turns out that you can also, with some work, you can make the Bordeson category in the dagger category. But then you need to make some choices. Um, and what are those choices? Those choices are Hermitian structures. Uh, what is an Hermitian structure? So it's a little bit abstract definition again. Uh, so why does this make sense? A uh, Hermitian structure on a spatial on a spatial manifold is a diffeomorphism which is compatible with the HD structure from the reflected manifold to the dual object in the in the borders category. 
whereas a category has a duals, and it satisfies this relation. And why does this relation make sense? Why does this make sense? If you would uh, not write M here, but if you would write a vector space V, and it would be a map from V bar to V star, um, then, and then you, can, you can check for yourself that if you have such a map like this, that's exactly the same as a Hermitian inner product on the vector space. <coughs> Sorry. It's good that I have this while. Um, all right, so what's the statement? So the statement is that you need to choose some Hermitian structures to make <coughs> the borders of the so suppose that little that H is a uh, choice of permission structures on every object of the borders and category simultaneously, which is compatible with this joint union. Then using this, you can make the borders and category into a symmetric model dagger category. And the crucial formula is this very trivial looking expression, which is just like a basically what you would do to a matrix algebra. Like if you want to define the Hermitian adjoint, you would do bar transpose. So I'm doing bar transpose here. And then on objects, we have chosen a Hermitian structure which allows us to identify. Oh no, what did I do? Uh, which allows us to identify uh, M bar star with M, so that it becomes the identity on objects after this identification with HM. So then the dagger is the identity on objects, but it could be not the identity on morphisms. Um, okay. Now, additionally, if you have a topological field theory, which is also Z2 equivariant with respect to the, the reflections, um, then, uh, uh, you will, using this choice, you will get a symmetric monoidal dagger functor um, from this dagger category of ordisms uh, to super emission vector spaces. So I should explain some notation here. Um, so this, I denote by this, the symmetric monoidal dagger category that follows from this construction, but I put a little upper H here to remind myself that this construction uh, depends on uh, on the choice of permission structures, possibly very strongly. Um, yes, and this will land not actually in super vector spaces, but in uh, super emission vector spaces. As it turns out, I will go into that in a moment. And why is this nice? Well, I mean, it's nice because now our state spaces are suddenly they have inner products like you would expect from physics, and also because now we can require them to be positive definite, um, which would be something like reasonably reasonable to ask because then there would be Hilbert spaces, be it finite dimensional. So that's the next step. Um, if you have a topological field theory, which is C2 equivariant, um, then we say that it's reflection positive with respect to a choice of permission structures. Um, if the induced Hermitian inner products that I just talked about uh, on all state spaces are all positive definite. So we had this induced uh, symmetric monoidal dagger functor here, and we require it to land in super Hilbert spaces, not just in super Hermitian vector spaces. And here I wrote a little equation to tell you that it's, it's pretty concrete if you wanna know using all the data that I just gave you, what's the, uh, what the Hermitian inner product is on all the, um, on all the state spaces, it goes like this. So we wanna identify <coughs> the dual with the bar, that's the Hermitian structure on the, on the vector space, on the super vector space. And the first thing we do is we move the star inside using the fact that Z is a monoidal uh, functor. And then we have this very special choice of, uh, of Hermitian structures on every object, so HM, and we apply Z to that to get here. And then we use the Z2 equivariance uh, 
uh, of the functor to finally then appear. And this gives us a new product. We require it to be positive definite. And note that, yeah, again, that this all depends on this on this choice. The choice is really important. If I would compose somehow HM with some function F, um, and it would still be a Hermitian structure, and I would use that for, let's say that F is like an automorphism of M, and this will still be a Hermitian structure, and say just for the sake of argument that C of if f is maybe like minus the identity or something like that, then the resulting the resulting Hermitian inner product on the state space will be different by a sign. It will just be minus the thing from before. And therefore, if you start with something positive definite and you change the Hermitian structure to something different, it will actually be negative definite. So you cannot just demand it for all Hermitian structures. You have to pick a choice of Hermitian structures. Uh, and this, you can also see this in, ah, oh, I thought that was something else, but I would, okay, so this is first, <laughs> okay, so <laughs> we get back to the invertible case, so what happens in the invertible case? Um, so first thing I should say is that there turns out to be a somewhat canonical choice of Hermitian structure on the Bordism category for any internal fermionic symmetry group, as I gave, um, and from now on, we'll use that. Um, and then you can prove this theorem, which, uh, I mean, I'm not sure who I should cite here. So I cited everyone. I guess the original statement is due to Fried Hopkins. Then you have the great uh, reformulation of Yonekura for non-extended field theories and also Kekschel's Teichner using these dagger categories. Um, so what's the statement? So we start with this uh, invertible topological partition function, which is the same as an invertible topological uh, field theory. Um, then there's a distinction again between odd and even. Uh, in odd, it's a little bit nicer. Um, so for odd dimensions, a partition function has a reflection positive lift exactly when it factors through a homomorphism from the Bordism group to U1. So that's that's very nice um, and and oh yeah so and it's also unique so there can be many different reflection structures on a given topological field theory but somehow if it exists then the, then the, re the reflection positive lift is unique and as a consequence you get an isomorphism something like this which is closer to something you would find in the physics literature uh, Often they are closer to, uh, yeah, homomorphisms from the actual Bordism group. And and maybe I could mention here again what I already mentioned before that I'm doing discrete invertible topological field theories here, so I'm not getting this uh, Anderson dual thing that we had in the last presentation. Uh, this is a little bit of a simpler situation than that. And for D even, uh, it's a similar situation, but we only had this we had this additional example. Of Euler theories that you take, um, um, you, you took this lambda and you took it to the power of Euler characteristic, and that gives you a, a theory, um, invertible topological field theory. And if you take that, uh, if you take that to be a real number, then it turns out to be still in this definition still reflection positive. So you have this extra weird factor of R positive hanging around, uh, but otherwise it's very similar. Okay, then I hope that now is the example. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so that's a, this is a subtle example that I wanted to highlight. It's nice to ponder about. So what's the difference between the, the internal symmetry group Z mod two and the internal symmetry group Z mod two? Uh, I mean, mathematicians, I guess, would say they're the same, but for me, this one contains minus one to the F as a non-trivial element. And here, uh, minus one to the F is equal to one. Um, so that makes them different, um, but, but otherwise they are extremely similar in, uh, as internal symmetry groups. So what happens? So if you run the story that I just told you, the two internal symmetry groups, maybe as expected by the physics, will give you the space-time structure groups um, spin 
and SOD cross Z mod two respectively. But the funny thing is, is in dimension one, they're actually equal. They're just equal on the nose. They're both Z mod two. Um, additionally, you also have this isomorphism. Um, they're both Z mod two. However, there is one subtlety, which is that um, in one of the cases, the, the generator is the anti-periodic circle and the other is the periodic circle. Uh, what do I mean by that? So there are not many connected one-dimensional uh, manifolds with these structure groups. Um, there are just two. You have the circle with periodic boundary conditions and anti-periodic boundary conditions. And maybe um, you know that uh, for, the, for the spin case, it is actually the anti-periodic um, boundary condition that's bounding. Um, but for the SOD crossing one two, it's the other way around. It's a little bit unexpected, maybe if you've never seen it before. Um, and as a consequence, if like the theorem that I put on the last page is true, um, then, well, the, the only, in both cases, you should have a single non-trivial reflection positive convertible topological field theory. But yeah, I mean, it should be a homomorphism from the board as a group. But in one case, it should map the periodic circle to minus one. While in the other case, it should map the anti periodic circle to minus one. So it's the other theory that's reflection positive if you take the other symmetry group. And there's, there's only one way, in my opinion, that you can make these two different notions of reflection positivity happen. Namely, you have to choose a different Hermitian structure on the borders of the category. Um, so there's a different Hermitian structure associated to it in which you have to put an additional spin flip on one of the two points. Um, okay, so that's a subtle example. Um, so let's see, I'm a little bit out of time right now. Um, and I don't want to rush too much. Um, so let's see. Um, I think I'll just, I'll just mention this in a few words. So I just wanted to say that uh, it's not very well known, but you can make spin statistics uh, also very precise for topological field theories. And I don't know if the, due to who this is, but I learned this from a nice paper by Theo Jones Free. Um, and basically the argument, the argument goes as follows. So physically, the spin statistics theorem just says that if a particle has half integer spin, then it's a fermion and the other way around. And it's actually a theorem for, as far as I understand, for unitary for reflection positive theories, uh, or it should be. But otherwise, it's a definition. If you can require a topological field theory to satisfy this. Um, and how do you make this physics definition precise? Well, uh, you have to make the observation that um, basically a representation of a spin group has integral spin if and only if, well, if it's like factors to SOD. So if the element of the kernel to the map to SOD um, acts trivially. And then you can make a definition uh, that's roughly the following form and it has several generalizations, but this is the simplest one that if you have a like super representation of spin, then it satisfies spin statistics exactly when this element is exactly the grading operator. And this formulation has several uh, generalizations um, to topological field theories and including internal symmetry groups. And let's see what I want to do. Maybe I just want to uh, at least highlight that it, it's known. I, I'm not sure how well known it is, but um, you can show which in which of the invertible topological field theories uh, satisfy spin statistics. Um, so all of the reflection positive ones do, all of them in, in even dimensions do, even the not reflection positive ones. And again, in odd dimensions, uh, there's a weird condition that it depends on the Euler characteristic of uh, H-manifolds. And I don't know how to say it more simply than this, unfortunately. Um, okay, um, yeah. And then I had some 
result finally um, that I'm working on together with Lucas Miller in which we explore two dimensional um, extended topological field theories with target super algebras. And we, um, we've classified um, all uh, topological field theories with internal fermionic symmetry group satisfying spin statistics, um, at least in time preserving case. And we're working on the case without time preserving, it's still in progress. So um, this is not really a conclusion, this, this is more of like a uh, happy ramble, like uh, let's, get, let's get the physics closer to the math. And when physicists talk about unitary and statistics, we can actually say what it is. And, and that's fun, I think. So thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Luke, for this very interesting talk.